Hello, everyone, and welcome to our July Bank Council Roundtable. Uh, as mentioned, it is on preparing for, mitigating, and responding to whistleblower retaliation claims, a topic I have very little familiarity with, thank God. But we have a panel who does have familiarity with it. And uh, joining us today, we have Sandy Kuhn, who is the HR Strategy and Employee Experience Director at the Huntington National Bank. Prior to that, she was an EVP and Chief Human Capital Officer at TCF, and before that, the Chief Human Resource Officer at Chemical Bank and Talmer Bank in Michigan. Also with us today, we have Melissa Rafan. Melissa is a Minneapolis-based partner and former chairperson of our labor and employment group. She represents banks, broker dealers, and other financial institutions in state and federal courts in dealing with their most sensitive employment matters. We have Tom Scanlon, who is a Washington DC based partner in the finance and restructuring group and a former attorney at the Federal Reserve Board. Tom's government service includes his work as the principal attorney for the Department of Treasury's team to help draft the Consumer Financial Protection Act of 2010. So if you're still upset about Dodd-Frank, you know who to blame. Uh, since joining Dorsey, Thomas counseled banks and other financial institutions to adapt financial products or services to changing rules. And finally, we have uh, Mike Rowe. Mike is a Minneapolis-based partner in our trial department, also represents broker-dealers, banks, and others in or relating to the financial services industry in all types of litigation and arbitration from FINRA to federal courts of appeals and everything in between. Without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Mike. Well, thank you, Tom, for that warm introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Tom mentioned, this month's roundtable focuses on uh, preparing for and mitigating whistleblower retaliation claims. And uh, we're going to proceed uh, kind of in three phases. We're going to start with a quick primer on uh, state statutory retaliation laws. Uh, from there, Tom Scanlon is going to talk briefly about some of the federal whistleblower statutes. And then uh, the brunt of our presentation today is going to be a panel discussion, again, about preparing for mitigating and responding to whistleblower claims. And so uh, to begin the uh, state statutory regime, this first slide is uh, just to introduce the concept of just how broad state whistleblower retaliation laws extend across the country. Uh, roughly, certainly all states have some type of retaliation law in the books. About half of them, uh, including where much of the population resides, uh, apply their retaliation laws to public and private sector employees. The genesis of uh, today's discussion and topic isn't necessarily uh, uh, which states uh, apply the law and which don't, but it has been our recent observation that claims under these statutes have somewhat exploded in, in the uh, recent past. Uh, there, there are any number of reasons for this. Some of this might have to do with uh, some well-publicized awards under federal law. Uh, it, it certainly uh, hasn't escaped our notice in both the legal press and in the popular press about whistleblowers uh, who are receiving outside, outsized awards uh, for, for blowing the whistle on, on their employer, for example. It, it, you don't have to look very far to see examples of this with the SEC, for example, where there have been seven and, and even eight figure awards uh, to these whistleblowers. So that might have something to do with it. Um, th there's plenty to do with what's going on either regionally or nationally as just one very simple example in the past 16 months, we've all been dealing with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and there's evidence to suggest that during that time, there's been a surge in whistleblower claims brought to the attention of OSHA. And so uh, that certainly is a reason uh, uh, for whistleblower claims. Uh, but as pertinent for today's discussion, um, we've observed and, and believe anyway that the, the uh, increase in whistleblower claims uh, nationally 
may relate to the complexity with, within which banks, broker dealers, and other financial, financial institutions operate. Um, and employees of, of these entities often have uh, um, visibility into at least what, what they may consider to be uh, something that approaches a line. And when they face uh, uh, an adverse job consequence, and then that's a divine term we'll discuss uh, a little bit later, they may connect the two. Uh, together. And so uh, when, when, when you're in a highly regulated environment, a complex environment, such as what banks and other financial institutions operate in, um, it, it really uh, uh, is a, a ripe environment for these types of claims. And of course, it, it doesn't hurt that many of these statutes, Minnesota included, include provisions uh, for attorney's fees should a, a employee and plaintiff uh, uh, succeed. And so uh, how we'd like to uh, proceed today is, uh, at least in talking about the state statutory retaliation laws, is, is to evaluate Minnesota's act and, and to give you a brief background on, on the type of claims that can be made under the statute. And so he, here is the law itself, and, and certainly uh, we, we don't need to read it verbatim, but this is a pretty standard uh, whistleblower retaliation statute. Um, it provides that an employer shall not take an adverse action against an employee who makes a good faith report about a su suspected violation of the law. For any labor and employment attorneys who, who are on the call today, these types of claims are evaluated in court under what has become known as the McDonnell Douglas burden shifting test. And all that means is that the plaintiff will make a prima facie showing of uh, its case. Uh, if it does, if the plaintiff does that, the burden shifts to the employer to provide a legitimate non-retaliatory reason uh, for the employment decision. And uh, if the defendant, the employer makes that showing, uh, the burden shifts back to the plaintiff to suggest or to prove that the employer's proposed rationale is pretextual. And so here are the elements of a prima facie case of a, a, again, under the Minnesota Whistleblower Act, which again is a standard whistleblower retaliation statute. And there are, there are just three, and we'll talk about these three briefly, but they are the employee engaged in protected conduct under the act. They suffered an adverse job action or consequence, and there's a causal connection between the two. So in Minnesota, to engage in protected conduct is it means to have made a good faith report of a violation of any federal, state, uh, common law, or regulation. It, it, it is really that broad. Uh, the report does not need to identify the precise law at issue. Uh, the report does not need to uh, uh, have anything to do with uh, stating the purpose of the report. In other words, the employee's its intent is irrelevant. And as you might expect, that report can come in any number of different formats. It could be verbal, written, or, or electronic. And so uh, really it is quite broad. And if I, if I could just add, Mike. Um, Please. There are no magic words. You know, I've had plaintiff's attorneys ask the HR person, are there magic words that my client had to use to get this on your radar screen? You know, and the HR person has said no magic words. Um, but I think you kind of know it when you see it. You know, if it comes through the hotline, it's easy because we all get that it's a hotline report. But sometimes there, there is language in emails that should grab the employer's attention, you know. I don't know if this is a violation or law, of law or, you know, I feel like the code of conduct requires that I bring it up. Like there is certain language that should really um, move this up on the radar screen of the reader. And, you know, what I think is in 2021, the volume of email that we all are getting is so high that it'd be pretty easy for a report to kind of slip through the cracks. So that's just something to, I think it's important for employers to train people on. And I will say, um, much to the chagrin of defense lawyers, this element has really been watered down by court decisions, particularly in Minnesota since about 2013. And it used to be that the employee had to have an objective basis. In fact, that's been replaced by good faith. 
And it used to be that the purpose of the report had to be to protect the public. And that too has been watered down. And now you can see the purpose of the report is irrelevant. So this is an area protected conduct has become an element that is pretty easy for a plaintiff to make out because there are no magic words. And, you know, it, it really kind of falls to the employer to read for this language in communications it gets from employees. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you for adding that. So the second element uh, under this uh, statutory scheme is that there must be an adverse employment action. And the, the word penalize is defined in, in Minnesota's scheme, uh, but to paraphrase, excuse me, paraphrase, um, you know, this obviously means termination if an employee is terminated uh, for making a good faith report, but it also encompasses a reduction in responsibility, compensation, even the, the prestige of, of that employee's uh, uh, perceived view as, of his or her job. And uh, Melissa just shared with me today a summary judgment opinion uh, affirmed by the Minnesota Supreme Court that really uh, gets at just how broad a adverse action entails. And the court there described it as a tangible change in working conditions that produce, produces a material employment disadvantage. And so yet again, th this is another element in under the Minnesota Whistleblower Act that uh, really can be defined uh, quite broadly. The, the third and final element under the Minnesota Act anyway, is there must be a, uh, uh, a causal connection between the adverse employment event and the good faith report. And this is really where the a lot of the action is anyway, uh, uh, on, the, on behalf of employers. And so here, re retaliate, retaliatory motive, uh, if it can be shown, is definitely evidence of causation. Temporal proximity uh, could be evidence of causation. Um, but here, uh, the, the case law differs, but uh, certainly when we're talking about temporal proximity, we're really talking about days and weeks and, and maybe a month or two. But much beyond that, um, we've seen anyway in the case law that courts are unlikely to find temporal proximity once you start talking about two, three, four, five months. And then, of course, for employers, it's really important to, uh, in defending these claims, is to see if you can't identify intervening events that break the uh, causal connection. And so, uh, you know, like I said, this is this is really where the action is when these cases are litigated is, um, is in breaking the chain between the good faith report and the adverse action. And so that is the uh, Minnesota uh, Whistleblower Retaliation Act. Again, it, it's quite similar to other states that have uh, similar schemes that extend to private employers. But now I'd like to turn it over to Tom, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the federal whistleblower statutes. Tom? Mike, good afternoon, and thanks for all for attending this, this afternoon's program. Uh, we're grateful for your attendance and for your participation. Today, we're going to focus on two laws or two standards that are important for financial institutions. The protections for employees flow from several types of sources, but the most important law, perhaps, is Section 1057 of the Consumer Financial Protection Act of 2010. This is the provision of the act that provides employee protections and the, um, the, the thrust of this act is similar to other types of laws that we've seen, um, including in some respects, the Minnesota law that Mike just describes. Also, we're gonna focus on the safety and soundness, soundness standards that the controller has adopted in this area and uh, show that even without a straight ahead law that provides employee protections, the expectations by the banking agencies is for a bank or holding company to have a strong whistleblower protection policy in place for employees to, to use in order to report up on suspected uh, acts of misconduct or other violations. Go to the next slide, Mike. In section 1057 of the CFP Act, there's a general prohibition against a covered person or a service provider to a covered person that bars the person from terminating or otherwise discriminating against 
any covered employee from engaging in one or more protected activities. The covered employee is defined as any individual that performs a task related to the offering or provision of a consumer financial product or service. And that's pretty broad, right? That could be any individual that's performing tasks. If the discrimination or the termination occurs, then the employee may bring an action with the Department of Labor through an administrative proceeding. And that proceeding is conducted first in the, in the Department of Labor, but then also is subject to review by the district court or by any party by the Court of Appeals. The standards for the Department of Labor to review a complaint raised by a covered employee, by and large are similar to those that Mike outlined from the Minnesota law. And what's important about the scope of section 1057 of the Consumer Financial Protection Act is that the four protected activities that the employee may engage in are fairly broad and focused at the same time. First is that the covered employee is protected against uh, engaging in action to provide information to the employer itself or to the Bureau or to any other agency that has enforcement authorities uh, over the covered person or the, or the service provider. Second, the employee is permitted to engage in, test in testimony in any proceeding that results from the administration or enforcement of any provision of the Consumer Financial Protection Act or other federal consumer financial law. The employee is protected from uh, for filing or causing to be filed any proceeding, or more, uh, more broadly, objecting to or refusing to participate in any activity that the covered person or the service provider is engaging in that the covered employee has a reasonable belief may constitute a violation of any law. But the scope of each of these four protected activities is narrow in, in the terms that the activity must flow, the activity of the covered person or the service provider must tie back to a law that is subject to the jurisdiction or is enforceable by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. In other words, it's not just any law, it's the law that Title 10 governs, the federal consumer financial laws that the employee is protected for. We'll go to the next slide. The uh, OCC, of course, has adopted safety and soundness standards that apply to the risk management principles for a board of directors. And um, we don't have it here, but just to be sure, there are, of course, similar standards by the other federal banking agencies. And recently, for example, the Federal Reserve has drawn attention to the need for policies and procedures for a holding company to have a whistleblower program and that's in the board's recent supervisory letter, which is SR21-3. That was published in February of this year. For the OCC standards, the board is charged with maintaining the bank's operations in a safe and sound manner. And the OCC has repeatedly emphasized the need for the board to take charge to build the corporate culture, it does not condone, or encourage imprudent risk-taking, unethical behavior, or the circumvention of laws or regulations that could amount to unsafe or unsound banking practices. Go to the next slide, Mike. Within the code of ethics that the bank is charged to implement and the board is responsible for supervising, the OCC states that First, the Code of Ethics should encourage the timely and confidential communication of suspected misconduct to higher levels within the bank, and then expressly describes that other elements that are embedded within the Code of Ethics should include a whistleblower policy for the bank to have a process in place for employees to report the legitimate concerns about the bank's activities that may amount to illegal, unethical, or questionable practices. We'll go to the next slide. Of course, the um, Bureau has 
well known to have acted on whistleblower complaints and information submitted by whistleblowers for engaging in the Bureau's own investigation or enforcement activity. And the history here is quite, um, quite well known. What's important, we believe, for, um, for all the financial institutions, the covered persons and service providers to be aware of, though, is that the Bureau continues to provide what, what I frankly would just call a welcome mat. Here are the resources made available to an individual who seeks to file a whistleblower complaint with the Bureau. The resources are readily made available on the Bureau's website. And in this regard, it's important for the covered person or service provider to bear in mind that if the individual were to have submitted a complaint through the Bureau's website, there is a risk that the covered person or the service provider could compound a potential investigation or enforcement action by taking action against the whistleblower directly. That would give rise to an independent violation, that is an independent violation of Section 1057 of the Consumer Financial Protection Act. Go to the next slide. And then we've included in the materials this afternoon some uh, references to other laws that provide whistleblower protections that may be of interest to financial institutions or to others who are attending this afternoon. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you. And, and so with, with the state and federal statutory regimes uh, kind of in our rearview mirror, uh, you know, the question becomes what can employers do? What can banks do? to mitigate these risks and, and if necessary, respond to them. And so uh, we've, we've broken this up into kind of the pre-report and the post-report uh, phases of a whistleblower claim. And I, I think the most natural place to start, Sandy, is, is with you. And, and my question to you to, to kick things off is, you know, these types of presentations, you know, many of us have, have been to, to something similar, and there's always a discussion of, a, a culture of compliance or a culture of transparency. And, and given your roles uh, uh, over your career, you've kind of had a front row seat to that. And so my, my question to you is, is what has that meant in your experience? Can I just so correct you, Mike? Mike? She hasn't been, a, she hasn't had a front row seat. She's been on that stage. <laughs> That's a myth. You, you always have a better way of with words than me. <laughs> well, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Melissa. Um, you know, the 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 thing that we all want to do in these situations is prevent them from happening and prevent them from blowing up. We we want to do the right thing, and so you know, creating that culture and starting to work on that the culture of transparency and creating a an environment where you welcome feedback um, from employees at all levels and you provide you know multiple channels for that to happen um, but creating that environment where you know managers are talking to their employees regularly about how things are going what could be improved um, creating opportunities for open dialogue and discussion about where we've got challenges in the organization and what we can do to make them better um, it takes time to build that. And it takes a lot of trust to get that built up, um, but it is well worth it as you mo as you migrate through this journey to focus on that culture, um, because the last thing you want is a culture of fear uh, and, uh, and and employees who are afraid to come forward with, hey, I think this isn't quite right. And it takes a lot of work. It really does. And a lot of purposeful work to be able to drive that culture of transparency. But but it's essential, Mike. Absolutely essential. And, and so, Sandy, one of the things that you mentioned in our preparation was something that you called a, a skip level meeting. I guess, mm -hmm. one, could you define that? And then two, uh, you know, talk about that and maybe some of the other things that, that you've seen uh, work as, you know, particularly effective in creating this culture. Sure. So, you know, the thing to recognize is that sometimes that direct manager is not the place that employees necessarily feel most comfortable in articulating what's happening. 
Um, and in some cases, you know, maybe the manager is part of the issue that's, that's occurring. So the skip level meetings are really important. And what those are is when, you know, a manager that's two or maybe even three, three levels above um, those that are, that are uh, working right on the front lines takes the time to meet with those employees and ask the questions. How is it going? Are you, is there anything that you feel like we're not doing correctly? Um, Roundtable discussions are also helpful. We've done uh, various focus group sessions at different times to say, hey, you know, we're challenged on, on how, to, how to fix this issue or how to correct this problem. Let's engage with employees. Um, many times they have pretty good insight into what needs to get done. And it's just a matter of giving them a safe place to be there. Um, your HR representatives, your HR business partners play a very key role here. Um, and so strategically, those business partners need to be connected to your business segments and spending time in those business segments. Um, they tend to have some really good relationships, good, good solid um, trust within the organization. And having them get out there and meet with, with their um, employees that they support and get into the field to see how things are really going is important. You got to have a lot of eyes on this to be able to see it from multiple directions to uncover some of these things. It's amazing at times how, you know, a group of employees can feel like something isn't quite right, but there isn't one in the group that's willing to kind of raise their hand and come forward and say, I really think we need to look at this. But if you've got multiple conversations going up, you've got people looking at it from different perspectives with their ears open and willing to listen. Um, you can get some hints where you've got some issues that may be bubbling and you want to capture them before they, they get really bad. And just maybe, maybe Mike, if I could add a couple things. Um, yeah, of course. You know, Tom's comment about the CFPB's welcome mat for um, whistleblowers. I sort of envision, you know, those mats that people have like outside their houses, you know, you can imagine that the mat at the CFPB says bring a claim, right, where you where you wipe your feet. Um, okay, so the culture of compliance, I guess what I would add, from having prepared witnesses for depositions and whistleblower claims, like if I'm preparing the supervisor, I, I always laugh when I um, ask, you know, are you familiar with the code of ethics? And I have it in front of me, so in case they never saw it before, they can see it right then. And they say, you know, I, you know, I just looked on the internet last night because I thought you might ask me that. I think it's really important, um, you know, when Sandy talks about culture of compliance for the leadership to be talking about it, right? It can't be kind of a once a year or even once a quarter. There just should be enough talk about it that employees know like where to look if they want to raise a concern. And they have to believe that it really does matter to leaders and there's no better way to do it, I think, than if leaders are actually talking about it. And I don't mean it to sound forced or artificial, but I think leaders have to find a way to really just bring it into their business meetings, not, you know, have a special meeting with the compliance department to make it to really bring the points home. And Sandy made a great point about HR. I always feel like HR people really need to do a public relations campaign so that people who know who they are, you know, I, I had dinner, like at a dinner table conversation with my kids, um, some of whom are in the workforce. I'll, I'll just leave it like that. I, I was saying something about an employee who hadn't gone to HR. That's the kind of dinner table conversation that employment lawyers have. And my kids said, mom, no one would ever go to HR. And I thought, you people don't even work. How do you know who would or wouldn't go to HR? But, but the issue is people kind of have that view, right? Like HR is not a place that you want to go to raise a concern. And I think companies, you know, for so many reasons really need to change that perception and really I think can do it if HR people make themselves accessible. And finally, Sandy made a great point, which I wanna bring home with an example. And that is HR people really need to understand the business because I, I was defending a company in a whistleblower claim where the whistleblower had sent like um, a very lengthy email to the HR person. It filled like two phone screens of you know language. And the HR person said, Amazingly enough, she had never read it. And I said, you, you never read the report? And you know, while in some ways that was good for the litigation, she said, oh, I didn't even understand it. It was talking about some business thing. 
And I think it's really important for HR people to be in the business and really understand what the business does. Maybe not every, you know, statutory site, but really understand what the business does. So they understand the significance of certain language and certain phrases and certain words when it comes to their attention. And Melissa, we'll probably talk about this a little bit later as well, but, um, you know, the relationship that the teamwork that needs to come together on this is really important. So the relationship between HR, between legal, um, our compliance team, our internal audit, that is a team that needs to really have a good relationship amongst each other and respect the, the um, specialties that they all bring to the table. Because, you know, we'll talk about it later, how important it is for that team to work together to understand how best to approach these things. But again, it, it starts before that. Build those relationships beforehand have those partners helping to keep HR apprised of areas of potential concern that we can lean in further. Um, but you don't want HR to be the police. I mean, that is not helpful for them to be, you know, police officers. What is helpful is for them to be partners on how we build a, a company that is committed to doing the right thing um, and creates that culture around it. So. So Sandy, stopping there, how do you, uh, in your experience, how, how have those relationships been fostered? How, how, you know, what, what, what steps have, have you seen taken to, you know, help HR and internal audit in, in some of the other departments who maybe have been viewed historically as, as, you know, the, the, the police, um, you know, how, how do you get them involved with the business in a meaningful way to, to really foster deep relationships of trust? Yeah, I, th I think it starts with um, collaboration and uh, it's got to start before you've got a problem. Yeah, sure. So to, to bring those teams together and to really in the open talk about how we need each other to be successful and to discuss what role each around the table plays and in the, the sharing of information, there's got to be trust amongst those team members to be able to share information with each other. So I, I think you've got to pull that team together pur purposefully. You've got to talk about how you interact with each other um, and appreciate the, the unique perspectives. It, it, it's up to me from HR to understand what our legal department is really focused on and why they're focused on it. Same thing with our compliance team. If we can increase understanding and appreciation um, through bringing that team together and meeting on a regular basis, taking a look at where concerns are, you're going to be in a much better position when you need to solve a problem, when you need to react. That team is not going to be unfamiliar with each other. I think building that trust beforehand is something that will pay huge dividends down the road. Yeah. Huge dividends. So, Tom, I, I want to address this next question to you. So, um, Melissa and Sandy have have rightly talked about um, the the culture of compliance and transparency, and, and some of the the maybe softer aspects of that. Um, but, the, but there's also a really formal aspect of this, which is written policies and procedures. Um, and I, you, you mentioned this in your discussion of of some of the the, the federal regimes, um, whistleblower regimes. Can you talk a little bit about what uh, what formal policies um, banks need to have uh, with respect to, uh, um, well, let's start with, with whistleblower um, type uh, allegations. Sure, I'd be glad to. So to take the OCC uh, safety and standards standards for the starting point uh, and to focus our attention on, on at least one set of standards for the national bank or federal savings bank. So the scope of the code of, Cond uh, code of ethics and the scope of a whistleblower protection program that a bank may adopt will vary, of course, by the scale of the business and the range of activities and even the geographic or other dimensions of the bank's business that will affect employees and managers, supervisors, and officers. Um, in, in my experience, the, the bank is not going to be subject to a uh, straitjacket of requirements and the banking regulators are fairly flexible in, in permitting the bank to have sufficient discretion and, and latitude 
to shape the, cult, the code of ethics and the whistleblower protection program to suit the real business needs for the bank, or in the case of the Federal Reserve, for a holding company. And as Sandy described, the, I, I believe that the thread that runs through the, the safety and soundness standards for the OCC, for example, is to design the code of ethics and the whistleblower protection program so that those various teams within the bank, legal, HR, risk, and audit, are actually working together to promote the culture of transparency and accountability to encourage employees and managers to report up and to provide a framework so that the basic standard that the OCC has announced that the bank should not engage in imprudent risk taking or acts that constitute circumvention of law may be identified early on in the process. So Sandy, riffing on Tom's comments uh, a little bit, there, there is an aspect of internal policies and procedures that may necessitate, quote unquote, showing your work. In other words, um, you know, documenting decisions that were made as uh, uh, the bank, for example, goes down the road of you know, its well-established policy. Can, can you talk a little bit about the importance uh, of, of doing that if and when um, a, 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 an allegation of wrongdoing is made? Yeah, absolutely, Michael. I mean, the challenges in many cases, in the, in the moments where um, there are important conversations that are held or important messages that have been sent, those moments happen, you know, months perhaps before you actually get a formal situation and they build on each other. So the key is as HR professionals in, in conjunction with our legal partners is when you start to get performance issues um, that are starting to bubble in certain areas of the bank um, and at certain levels of the bank, it is really important to start to document those so that you have a track record of those conversations that have occurred. Um, and in the moment, they may not seem like they're, um, like it's that necessary to be that formal, um, but you know, hopefully you'll never have to refer back to them. But if you do have to refer back to them, having that, that trail is really important. So I would say, make sure your HR um, team members are very aware of um, when we're dealing with performance issues in critical areas or critical functions or at you know higher levels of the organization that that documentation becomes something that is very important and the and your legal partners can help you navigate through that to make sure that you're capturing it appropriately okay i think you know i think a real challenge in 2021 is time you know mm -hmm. i think i mean people have seem to have less time now than they ever had before because you know companies have done reductions in force everyone's just like their jobs got bigger and now that you know there's been work from home email has just you know got, like grown exponentially so mm -hmm. how how do you suggest people actually take the time to document when you know what they always say to the lawyers is you know if i documented everything i'd never be able to do my job believe <laughs> I totally get it. I feel the same way. But, you know, what's the, what's like, what advice do you have as a senior HR person on documentation? Well, I mean, I think our employee relations teams that tend to be in, involved in these things, as well as your senior HR leaders, um, we can leverage those to help with some of that documentation. They need to be well knowledgeable, well skilled in, in these type of areas so that they understand the key components of those conversations to have. And, you know, Melissa, it's a little bit of, you know, if I don't have time to plan because I'm too busy doing, and then all of a sudden I don't find myself in the right place, right? So it, it's, you gotta stop and realize the importance of taking that extra time to get the, the documentation down because if you need it, trying to recreate it is, um, is virtually impossible and it could really put you at a disadvantage if you don't have that. So you're talking, you know, take a half hour 
but leverage your HR team. They will help with that communication or with that documentation and understand what those key components are. So as much as I wish there was a magic wand here, Melissa, to figure out how to get more than 24 hours in a day, I don't think it is. I think it's more a commitment um, to understanding that that documentation will be really, really important if and ever that you need it. So there, there's one more uh, topic I want to discuss with respect to a, a you know, quote unquote, pre-reports um, issue. And, and Tom, I, I want to ask you, and, and this gets to the fifth bullet point on the slide, is uh, talk about in the context of potential whistleblower allegations, the importance of having a, a strong pre-existing relationship with your key regulators? Well, for a bank or a financial holding company or a strong relationship with the examination team for the OCC or the FDIC or for the Federal Reserve, of course, virtually is taken as a given. Um, and the need to cultivate strong professional relationships with the examiners and particularly with the examiner in charge from time to time will affect the bank's business in so many ways. But in this area of the safety and soundness standards that the banking agencies prescribe, the real risk is that if, there, if the bank or the financial holding company does not have a strong ex relationship with this examiner in charge for the code of ethics and the, and the procedures that should be in place to uh, permit a whistleblower to report off on questionable practices that are occurring, then the examiner in charge or the other staff of the banking agency may perceive the policy to be a sham. And that is going to create a secondary layer of issues for examination of, that are going to run parallel to the investigation of the, of the alleged underlying conduct. The, the need for the bank or the financial holding company to have that relationship also will be important in order to demonstrate that the bank or the holding company responded meaningfully to serious allegations and by contrast could quickly identify or respond appropriately to allegations that were meritless. In fact, in section 1057 of the Consumer Financial Protection Act, there is an express provision that governs the filing of a frivolous complaint brought by a covered employee. And so to explain to the examiner in charge that the bank received a certain number of complaints over a certain period of time and uh, describes the reactions to those complaints by distinguishing, for example, those that were perceived to be meritorious and those that are not, um, the, the bank shouldn't run the risk of a credibility gap by neglecting to have that existing relationship with the examiner in charge that could help to support the credibility or the judgments that the bank is making for itself. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Tom. Mike, before we leave this slide, I, I think that the last bullet, I was hoping you were gonna call that one out, but, cause I put it up. Yeah, but, well, let's, yeah, please, please do. Um, but um, the last bullet, so I'm interested, Sandy and Tom, and what you think. I mean, my view is, you know how every year you have people certify, most companies have people certify, you know, I read the code of conduct and I understand I have to comply with it. And some, you know, I've seen some um, financial institutions where they go one step further and they have the employee say, you know, I, I don't have, there's nothing I have to report. And if there is, I'll fill out, you know, attachment A. I don't know if either of you have an opinion on whether you think that's a good practice to have employees have to actually like it's sort of an affirmative obligation to report each year so that, you know, if they kind of to Sandy's point, if two years down the road, they want to say something happened two years ago, well, you, you know, can show them the acknowledgement and say, but at the time you said nothing happened. So just curious, Sandy and Tom and Mike, as to your thoughts on those annual certifications. Yeah, that's interesting, Melissa. In, in my history, we have not done that. Uh, we do kind of the traditional annual acknowledgement of these code of conducts. Um, any new hire comes in and acknowledges them on their way into the organization. Um, we have not done a positive, in essence, confirmation that they have nothing to report. 
Um, you know, again, I, I think it, it, you've got to, you got to build up that trust because even, even putting something like a positive confirmation out there with the, without the trust of the organization, they'll look at that a little bit funny. Like, well, is there something I should know about that I don't, or, um, are there things that, you know, I should be, they're encouraging me to make sure that I do <laughs> that I'm not aware of. Um, you, they'll read all sorts of things into it. So again, I think it's a matter of continuing to speak to the organization that we want to do the right thing. And what does that look like? And how, how can our, our employees and our managers together work through these issues and make sure the bank is always doing the right thing? So I haven't, I haven't done that, Melissa, but it's an interesting concept. Well, and you know, I'm thinking like an easy way to show people that you do the right thing is let's just suppose like you wouldn't wish this on any entity, but you know, there's sort of a um, high profile whistleblower claim and somehow everyone, you know, sort of spreads like wildfire. A lot of people know, and then, you know, someone is let go as a result. That's sort of an easy way to show people you do the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. not, not something any, you know, entity wants to live through, but but short of that, it's hard to show that you do the right thing unless you sort of, I guess, find proactive ways to, you know, call people out. But okay, I, that was a little bit of a digression. Tom, I don't know if you had a thought on this annual certification or Mike, if you do. The only thought I would uh, offer to uh, supplement Sandy's comments is that the, the bank or the financial holding company shouldn't be tethered to an annual cycle, there would be other ways to implement a similar type of metric. And that might be, for example, when an employee is promoted or a person is reassigned to a different uh, scope of management responsibilities, particularly if the, if the reporting process might be adjusted by the new position that's being taken or the new business mm -hmm. line that the person is in charge of. But I think it, in general, it's a uh, definitely worth considering because the, the the need for employees to recognize that yeah these procedures are in place and should be used when appropriate is valid for the bank to identify for itself that its program does work so tom i sort of envision based on what you said like people come in and they fill out their covid certification you know i don't have any covid symptoms and oh by the way i don't have anything to report either and then you let them continue on their work day, right? Well, except that it might be, it might be one step below that. It might be that the employee just acknowledges that the presence of the policy and the procedures are in place. Not that there isn't or may or may not be anything to report. After all, if the employee elects to go to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau first and not to the employer, there's no downside under Section 1057 for that activity. Yeah. Well, Melissa, thanks for stopping there. I think that's uh, thoughtful and interesting and, and certainly something to consider. Um, I do, in our remaining time, want to get to this concept of uh, what to do once a report has been made. And um, everything we've talked about in this discussion so far are, are um, things that our financial institutions and banks can do to try to mitigate it. But of course, no system is perfect. Um, people aren't perfect. And so there are going to be allegations of, of wrongdoing, no, no matter how great um, our culture is. And so, the, Melissa, the first question I want to ask you, and it's, it's really returning to something you mentioned earlier, is uh, what does it mean to, to report something? Um, you, you've said there are no magic words, but this is, this is a hard question. And it is, but also really fundamental to the retaliation statutory schemes. And so, uh, what, if any, advice um, do you have in, in helping um, our financial institution clients try to answer this question? Well, it, it's a really good question. And I think it really, um, it depends on a couple things. It depends on how the report comes in. So sometimes it's, it's easy, right? I mean, if it comes in through the, um, through the entity's hotline, regardless of what the complaint is. I mean, and, and when I say regardless, I mean, a lot of times there are um, sort of issues about conflict of interest, but I would say conflict of interest like small c, small i, it might not be conflict of interest that's implicated by the code of conduct. It's just 
someone thinks that a senior leader made a hiring decision without going through the hiring process, right? So it ends up in the um, whistleblower line. So anything that comes in on the whistleblower line, usually companies have a protocol for how that's handled. So that's sort of easy. Um, if it comes in through a lawyer demand letter, that's another one that's pretty easy. I think what's harder is are the emails, right? Sort of the, or the obtuse or oblique references to things that are less clear. And I'm, I'm interested in hearing from Sandy on this, but you know, when I say no magic words, there, there are words that you do look for, right? Like, I think my manager X, or I think, you know, I've approved these, I've been asked to approve these loans and I really wonder, da, da, da. That might not be a whistleblower report until two years later when the person gets fired and the lawyer ties it back to a whistleblower report. So even though the employee doesn't have to make a report for the express purpose of protecting the public, a lot of times these employees aren't even making reports. They're truly asking a question about their job duties that their lawyer later is able to convert into protected conduct. So I, I, I hope that answered your question, Mike. I mean, because the short answer is if it doesn't come through an established channel, it's a judgment call. But I think it's probably more often than not worth having a discussion because sometimes in this arena, you're dealing with people who are very black and white in their thinking, and I'm referring to the whistleblowers, and um, gray just doesn't exist in their world. So I think if, the, if there can be a conversation about what exactly the concern was about the loans, and to Sandy's earlier point, a well-documented response, it could serve the employer really well later. Yeah, and that gets, Sandy, I wanted to follow up with you because that gets to another gradation of gray, um, which is maybe once the institution has determined that there is a quote unquote report or something near enough to a report, there, I, I imagine, is then a process to try to filter between reports that require uh, uh, investigation, reports that require maybe significant investigation, and then reports that may not require uh, much more than, you know, kicking the tires. And so I guess it's a long-winded way of asking, how, how do you differentiate between the, the, the types of reports that come in? Well, obviously the, the hotline reports um, are, are taken very seriously and need um, a good investigation attached to it. Again, this is where if it's coming in through the hotline, if it's coming in through very clear um, channels, uh, the tendency is to get the team together, that cross-functional team to take a look at it. Let's all understand who's doing what and who's gonna conduct the interviews. Um, being thoughtful about who will do the interviews is really important because depending on how sensitive the subject is or who's involved, um, who's, who the allegation is against, um, those conversations, you've got to think about the person that's going to do those conversations. Is it HR that leads it? Is it legal that leads it? Um, is it your, your risk team that is engaged in it? Uh, and it will depend on the severity of it. But HR tends to be um, the first level of trying to sort through some of that. Um, and there's an initial invest there's an initial conversation that HR needs to have to make sure they understand what the um, allegation is saying and clarifying questions to understand. And then I would say they've got to quickly get to a team of people, uh, your, your legal risk and HR team to say, let's look at this and where could this possibly go and how, what is our investigation strategy? And you come up with your investigation strategy. You know, you'll, you'll get the strangest things through the hotline that are not necessarily whistleblowers. You know, my manager is, you know, took everybody out to lunch and I was on vacation and he didn't reschedule it, you know, so I'm being discriminated against. And so you got to sort through some of that and it's very much judgment related. Um, but again, this is where objectively taking a look at the facts of what have been presented and not jumping to any conclusion is really important. People have got to not get ahead of themselves. You know, what we can't hear is, oh, I know that person and, you know, that's just kind of how they are and there's probably nothing to it. You can't jump to that conclusion. You've got to make sure you've got a strategy in place to get down to the facts of the situation um, 
and facts surrounding it. So that's where multiple interviews are mostly required to get down to what is the actual um, meat of the issue. Yeah. Um, um, that's very helpful. Thank you, Sandy. Tom, I, I want to, I, I, we're short on time and we can probably discuss this for another half an hour. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we're, we're not today, Mark. Yeah, not today. But Tom, there's one question I, I do want to make sure we get to you, which is um, kind of coming back to the idea of that strong pre existing relationship with regulators. And so, can you talk a little bit about um, when and in what circumstances? it's appropriate for a bank to have a conversation with its regulators about a whistleblower allocation. And then the, the sub point B to that question is when you were sitting in the regulator's shoes, how did you view those kinds of self-disclosures? The, the banking agencies have not established firm standards that would require a bank or a financial holding company to communicate the presence of a report to an examiner in charge, not that I'm aware of, but the need to disclose or to report to the examiner in charge might be dictated by the need for the bank or the financial holding company to demonstrate to the examiner that the bank's internal policy continues to operate as planned and that appropriate officers or even the, the board as appropriate continue to exercise the proper degree of oversight over the code of ethics and the other standards that the bank or holding company has in place. The, the, the pitfall, of course, from my experiences uh, might be that if the examiner in charge is not alerted to an internal uh, disruption in the policies and procedures that the bank or the holding company should have had in place, then the response to the employee's allegations will actually be compound, will demonstrate sort of a compound effect that the board of directors might be subject to review for neglecting to exercise a degree of oversight that the banking agency expects for the board. And, and so we're, we're kind of going back to that concept that Sandy talked about earlier about showing your work, um, mm -hmm. you know, doc, documenting your compliance and adherence to your own internal policies. Is that a fair characterization? Yes. And then what about that, that last subpart, Tom? Uh, did, uh, what, if any, view did you have about the appropriateness of, of self-disclosures when you were sitting on the other side? Um, were there instances where you expected it and didn't see it? Were there instances where you saw it but didn't think it was necessary? Could you talk a little bit about that experience? Well, there, there are both types, of course. And uh, the examiner in charge will want to be uh, kept informed of important and material developments for the bank or for the holding company. And uh, the decisions that would, that would sort of uh, hold those actions close and not have that type of discussion uh, should be fairly closely considered so that the bank or the particularly the board of directors does not appear to be acting in contravention with its responsibilities to exercise appropriate care and attention to the bank's policies. Well, that's great. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Melissa. I, this has been great. Um, your, your insights, uh, both from industry and from regulatory and Mel Melissa Yu has representing all manners of employers, I think it's been great. So thank you all. And, and thank you for those who have attended today.